so um, yesterday morning, you know, having been 13 months since I was invited to do this, I decided it was time to make my reservations for my hotel in Ames. And apparently, when it's game weekend, <laughs> uh, you can't get a hotel room waiting that long to reserve for less than $250 a night. <laughs> yeah, so as I was driving into Ames from Des Moines, where I spent the night, um, I stopped at a, at a come and go. And what struck me was that there was a Jimmy John's right next to the come and go that was open right at nine o'clock. And I thought that was, I thought that was peculiar. There aren't any Jimmy John's where I come from that open that early. Well, there are people who are tailgating in Independence looking for lunch. And I went into the come and go and it was wall to wall. Um, and, and this, okay, what team is it? The, is it the Cyclones? Cyclones? Okay, yeah. What? I'd, ain't my bag. And I still just don't care. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I just don't care. Um, it was amazing to me. The, the energy and the obvious um, excitement and the affiliation that folks had for each other when they saw those colors. And as we've been talking about reformation of the congregation these last several months and then today with a conversation about the dangerous act of worship, what struck me this morning was the sense of belonging that these folks had, that their affiliation with this team, with teams all over the place, um, the sense of belonging, the sense of recognition of one another that they have. And I thought, why don't we have that in the church? So that question I'm just, I'm just throwing out there as a question that I think should prompt all leaders of the church. As we think about what makes church, church, and what makes it matter to people, that part of it is this, is this belonging um, to God and to one another. So I would like to begin by completely reordering my, uh, my slideshow. We're going to begin today by talking about allegiance. And I was really glad that we sang, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Because we use the word love in this culture like we have any earthly idea of what we're talking about. It can mean all different kinds of things. It can mean the love of God on the cross. It can mean the love of a guy who's terrified his girlfriend is never going to speak to him again if he doesn't swing by high V at 5.30 on Valentine's Day to get those flowers. <laughs> we have a lot of confusion about what love is. We have a lot of fear about what love is and losing love. So it's kind of a loosey-goosey term in English. Oops. Oh, I guess that I don't point this direction, do I? There you go. Okay. I'd like us to begin today. I just want you to break into pairs, and if there's an odd number, then you can do threes. I'd like you to introduce yourselves. You guys, a lot of you know each other already, so you can skip that part if you need to. Where you're from, what you had for breakfast, yesterday. This is to get the synapses firing because yes, absolutely we are more than, than head beings, but I spend a lot of time in my head, so we're going to go up in there. And then I'd like you to consider one or two of these, these questions. What does the confession, Jesus is Lord, mean to you as a Christian? Because that's our oldest Christian confession, Jesus is Lord. What do you think the confession Jesus is Lord means for the world? And what does Jesus' lordship require of his followers? I would like you to take just a few minutes to pair up and take, and just, just don't overthink it. 
<laughs> we want to see what's what's. Those aren't thinking questions. No, 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 no. We're going to spend all day dealing with this. But I'd just like to see what some of the words are that bubble up for you. And I would also like to get you talking to each other. So do that. Um, what are some of the things that you heard from one another in that, in that little conversation? Omelets. Say what? Omelets. Omelets. Very, somebody had omelets for, or an omelet for breakfast yesterday. Did anybody have uh, cold coffee and goldfish crackers? Yeah, I'm not judging you, so don't judge me. <laughs> All right. What else? I'll start calling on people. Jesus as leader. Jesus as leader. Not, not so much as the answers, but the intonation of humbleness in even facing the questions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Christ is our example. And he expects us to follow his example, which actually segues nicely. <laughs> what does lordship require? We say a lot in the Christian church about the free gift of grace. It's not something that we can earn. So whatever it is that Jesus' lordship requires is not something that is required to make Jesus Lord. There's a word in Greek. The word is pistis. And you know, as they say, it is better to be pistis on than pistis off. No laughter at all. (laughs) Because that was a naughty joke. Um, We tend to translate it as faith. By grace you are saved through faith. That word is pistis. The word in Greek has a lot of nuance that the English language can capture, but often doesn't. So when we say, by grace you are saved through faith, we could also translate that, by grace you are saved through faithfulness. And then it becomes a question of, whose faithfulness? That particular verse in the book of Romans, the first chapter of Romans, isn't altogether clear if we're talking about the faithfulness or faith of us or the faith or faithfulness of Christ himself. Faith is another tricky word in the English language. We can define it as belief, which is a mental assent to something. We believe in the tooth fairy. We believe that the cyclones will win today. We believe that Jesus is Lord. We're mentally assenting to this, and that is faith. It can be the trust that we have in something or someone. I have faith that so-and-so is going to be able to do such-and-such. I have faith that the cyclones are, in fact, going to bring it home So it can be trust, but it can also be translated as allegiance. And some of the very common statements of our faith take on some nuance when we substitute the word allegiance. So who's got Bibles? Richard. What's your name? Krista. Krista. And Jessica. Richard, will you look up Acts 14? Krista, right? Okay. Um, Will you look up Acts 26 and Jessica, Romans 3? And let me know when you guys have them. Okay. Jessica, will you read Romans 3, verses 29 through 30? Since God is one, then the one who makes the circumcised righteous by faith will also make the one who isn't circumcised righteous through faith. 
Will you read that again, substituting allegiance and the proper preposition so that it makes sense? Oh, and I'm going to give this to you. Substituting it for faith. Yes, please. Okay. I think that's on. Or is God the God of Jews only? Isn't God the God of Gentiles also? Yes, God is also the God of Gentiles. Since God is one, then the one who makes the circumcised righteous by allegiance will also make the one who isn't circumcised righteous through allegiance. I want you to do faith first, please. Right. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, then on to Iconium and Antioch. There they strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, It is through many persecutions that we must enter the kingdom of God. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, then on to Iconium and Antioch. There they strengthened the souls of the disciples and then encouraged them to continue in the, in the allegiance, saying, It is through many persecutions that we must enter the kingdom of God. All right, faith first again? Yes, please. All right. And I will protect you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am going to send you to the Gentiles to open their eyes to their true condition so that they may repent and live in the light of God instead of in Satan's darkness, so that they may receive forgiveness for their sins and God's inheritance along with all people everywhere whose sins are cleansed away, who are set apart by faith in me. Okay. And I will protect you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am going to send you to the Gentiles to open their eyes to their true condition so that they may repent and live in the light of God instead of in Satan's darkness so that they may receive forgiveness for their sins and God's inheritance along with all people everywhere whose sins are cleansed away, who are set apart by allegiance in me. What do you think about that shift? How does it how does it sit with you? Does it feel does it feel weird? Seems more like you should be doing something actively. Seems more like you should be doing something actively than faith. More formal. More formal. Felt like you were not alone, that allegiance seems like there's more than one, that it's people pulling together. So, oh, golly. All right. And if somebody else would look up John 13, we're going to reference this in just a second. The story is Jesus, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. The night before Passover, he's sharing the meal with his disciples. He takes off his clothes, he puts on the towel, and he starts to wash their feet. And with just a little hiccup with Simon Peter being Peter, Jesus gets through that task, puts his clothes back on, sits back down with them, and what does he say to them? Do you guys remember? First words out of his mouth. Do you know what I have done? Do you know what I have done to you, not for you? Do you know what I have done to you? What he did was a precursor to baptism. What he did was mark them, not just with the water, but with this act of service, this act of grace, this act of unique lordship to our God. 
in our book of order, our theology of baptism says this, the Reformed tradition understands baptism to be a sign of God's covenant. Like circumcision, a sign of God's gracious covenant with Israel, baptism is a sign of God's gracious covenant with the church. Baptism is at once God's gift of grace, God's means of grace, and God's call to respond to that grace. Through baptism, Jesus Christ calls us to repentance, faithfulness, and discipleship. Through baptism, the Holy Spirit gives the church its identity and commissions the church for service in the world. Baptism is the bond of unity in Jesus Christ. This is all allegiance language, my friends. Covenant, faithfulness, unity, identity. But there are, as we know, competing loyalties. I'm going to read to you from an article that was in Fuller Magazine entitled Between Baptism and Belonging. Uh, Erin Default Hunter was the author. She writes, the year is 1994. On Easter Sunday, they stood side by side in the church choir singing the hymns that celebrate resurrection hope. Their faith was the fruit of one of the great success stories of Western mission and their country... Rwanda, was one of the most Christian of all on the African continent, about 85%. But just days after the Easter services, some of these Christians would take machetes to the bodies of those standing next to them, hacking them to death in a rampage of slaughter that lasted 100 days looking over the carnage of at least a half a million bodies. A cardinal visiting Rwanda asked a gathering of church leaders, are you saying that the blood of tribalism is deeper than the waters of baptism? And one leader replied, yes, it is. As theologian and priest Emmanuel Katangoli points out, Rwanda is far from unique and indeed reveals the flaccid faith too often masquerading as gospel. If we believe ourselves above such clannishness, peruse social media or news streams, tribalism abounds. Do you know what I have done to you? Do we? Does our worship remind us in every way of who and what it is we serve, of who it is we are saved by and subject to, of who in this universe is really, really at the top of the food chain. What Jesus has done to us is shown us that our human will to power is not only corrupt but powerless against him. The most powerful nation the world had ever seen crucified him, and it didn't stick. Christ's resurrection puts to shame our human impulses to dominate, terrorize, and destroy. They are nothing in the face of the kind of power that brings to life what once was well and truly dead. True worship of God puts humankind firmly in its place and places Christ's people in his kingdom. Our citizenship is sealed and signified by our baptism. And if our baptism is the sign of this, other people's baptism should also be the sign of our unity with them under one Lord. Remember your baptism and be thankful. This is another way of saying remember your citizenship and be loyal. But how deep does our loyalty go? I mean, really honestly, is blood thicker than water in this culture? We can ask that question. It rolls off the tongue pretty easily, and I'm sure most of us would say, of course, the waters of baptism. Of course, the waters of baptism run deep. But how deep? And it's not just the ISU game. 
It's all of the competing things in our schedules, which are so stupid packed full of other things. Is that thicker than water? Is our political affiliation thicker than water? I can't tell you how many people on both sides of the political divide I've heard say, I'm not sitting next to anyone who voted for insert name here. Is nation thicker than water? We'll get to one country's answer to this question this afternoon. How about is liking our pastor thicker than water? Pastor sermons just don't feed me. I'm out of here. I don't like how he dealt with that decision. I'm out of here. I keep keep bumping this, don't I? I don't like the tone she took with me. I'm out of here. Is getting our way thicker than water? If Session thinks that they can remove that half-dead tree that my cousin's great-aunt planted in honor of her second husband six weeks after their marriage when he died under mysterious circumstances, I am out of here. And I said sense of superiority, but I realized this morning that what I meant to say was our morality. Are our moral sensibilities thicker than the water of baptism? I'm not going to that church. Their organist is gay. As leaders of the church, we've got to reckon with these because we've got people who rely on us who are seeking belonging, who are tearing themselves apart with these sorts of things. So what does kingdom allegiance look like? Uh, Who's got John 13? Did I see it? Okay. Oh, no, no, keep it open, keep it open. And I can't quite remember how I set this slide up, so I think I'm going to have you read verse by verse. Will you read John? Oh, and let's get you the microphone. Would you read first John 13, 13? We are still with Jesus and the disciples after he's washed their feet. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So the first part of kingdom allegiance is we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Our allegiance to him is expected, not optional. Will you read the next verse, please? So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Allegiance, as you had mentioned, Rebecca, is communal, it's social, it's something that belongs to all of us, and belongs to each of us as an extension of it belonging to all of us. John thirteen fifteen, please. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Allegiance is transformational and incarnational. It's not something that we enter into so that we can escape from the way the world is, and it's not something that's purely spiritual. It's something that happens in these bodies and in this life. Okay, and 16. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. And this demands humility. Someone had mentioned humility. And it also demands sacrifice. And it demands the understanding that ever since God called Abraham and said, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as numerous as the grains of sand on the shore 
and I will give you this promised land of Canaan, but oh, by the way, there will be 400 years of slavery. From the very beginning, the covenant God has made with the people of God has pitted God against earthly powers of domination, enslavement, and terror. And we go up against those things at our peril. So did Jesus. And Amgad had mentioned this a little earlier. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son and daughter is more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, we could spend a week unpacking all of this, and we don't have to worry about God wanting us to hate our family members. That's not what Jesus is saying here. But this bit about taking up the cross, when Jesus said this, this was not a a poetic turn of phrase the way it is now. I mean, it's sort of a catchphrase for us now. I'm going to take up my cross. The cross was a state-sanctioned form of terror in the Roman Empire that was very, very, very effective at keeping conquered peoples where they wanted them. It was an embarrassment to a great many Romans. There's a lot of writing from particularly the first century Um, AD, where great statesmen and great thinkers are saying, we got to get rid of this. Polite society didn't even use the word cross. It was violent and it was vile. And that is exactly the place where God went for us, right where human domination was at its ugliest and most potent at the time. And Jesus promises us that those who find their life there, in those systems, will lose it. And those who lose their life, for my sake, will find it. So we're going to close this section with some thoughts from Lisa Cressman. Um, This is a a book that's more... uh, more geared toward preachers and sermon preparation, um, but near the beginning of it, she's got some, some general thoughts that are, that are really um, generally applicable. It's called The Gospel People Don't Want to Hear. And she writes, when we try to save our old life, our old allegiances, our old ways of being in the world, by holding up the sky as though it's crumbling around our ears, we are losing our life. When we insist our skies cannot fall because we cannot live without them, we're declaring that only death is real and that resurrection is not. And she goes on to say, however, when we do let those pieces fall and trust God that together and with God we can paint a new sky, we are gaining our life. We are gaining the life that our Lord intends for us to have. The color won't be the same shade as it was before, but the new shade will allow possibility and hope to lay claim upon us again. We can consent to God's will and call to be resurrected, to live, love, and serve again. That's what it looks like when our life as individuals and as Christ's church are saved. We love again. We love newly. We love differently. And this is the gospel that we and our people need to hear. And now I think it's probably time for a break. What do you guys think? We're going to talk now um, about what worship looks like when God's people are truly, truly allegiant. Uh, So the first thing, okay, we're going to do another warm-up to keep you guys excited and engaged. So um, I was thinking that we would mix it up and you would talk to different people, but let's get real. So you can skip the first two. Um, 
share with one another something you hope you never have to eat again, and then we'll, we'll send up prayers during grace at the end of this part of the presentation, um, that that's not what's for lunch. And then I want you to consider these three questions together, but you can also pick just one. What topics or issues would or has gotten your pastor in trouble if she or he preaches about them? When have you heard a sermon that you would describe as political? And I put that in air quotes because that's a big umbrella term, but you get to define it if you're answering that question. And what scripture passages, if you can think of any, would your pastor get in trouble for preaching? All right, talk amongst yourselves. So what all of that conversation was designed to get you think of is what your answer might be to this question. What subject matter should be kept out of the pulpit? Has, has any pastor here had the experience of somebody coming up to you unannounced or maybe announced saying, I don't believe that such and such has any business being preached? Yeah, so was your response, oh, I'm going to preach on that every day now. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm making friends and influencing people everywhere I go. Um, yeah, yeah, most pastors have had that experience, so we know that these concerns are out there. Um, what, do you guys, what do you guys think? What, what, should, what, should we, what should stay out of our preaching, our proclamation? What's that? Bad theology. Bad theology. Ah, but who, who gets to decide? <laughs> what else? What are some other things? Yes. Uh, who to vote for? Who to vote for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, others? All the people that God hates. All the people God hates should be kept out of the pulpit. Oh, goodness, yes. I grew, I grew up in one of those churches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. What else? Hopelessness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. righty. But let's think about this in terms of what would get the pastor in trouble if they preached about it? Sex? Sex? Sex is, is, no pun intended, a touchy subject. Yeah, yeah. What else? Money, thank you. Don't mention money. All you preachers ever do is talk about money. Well, guess what Jesus did too. But yeah, yeah, don't talk about money. That's private. That's between me and my God. Yeah, yeah, yes. Welcoming the stranger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's the follow-up question. Why? Why do our members, our fellow Christians in our churches, not want us to venture into this subject matter? It's uncomfortable. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And what do you think their worry is? Because they don't follow Jesus quite Some of it is the challenge to each of us. It, it challenges their image of Jesus. If it's not, even if it's not a visual image, the understanding of who Jesus is and how much Jesus looks like us mm -hmm. already here. Yeah, a lot of us are very... Um, satisfied with an image of Jesus, an understanding of Jesus, 
that if we're not hearing that reflected from the pulpit, that is incredibly anxiety provoking. But let's think about this in terms of our churches as a whole, not as individuals. What are people worried about if the pastor says something about black lives mattering or fetal lives mattering? Um, What if the pastor says something about um, immigration? about the need for stronger borders or about the need for open borders and pulling the gospel into these conversations, what are they worried is going to happen? Bingo. They are afraid that these highly polarized, highly divisive subjects are going to split the churches And the way it has often been framed to me is we don't have enough people that we can afford to lose anybody. And this isn't an afford like this. This is a survival afford. We can't lose any more people and remain viable as a congregation. There's a lot of of fear, a lot of concern. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not just that the not just that they will lose members, but you know, people get mad, that's all kind of surface stuff. But if it it may be something I have to rethink the way I think and mm-hmm. I don't know how to We might lose members and one of those members might be me. <laughs> and what am I gonna do out there on my own? This has been my church forever. Church forever. Yeah, the loss of the institution, the loss of the thing that has always been there. It's always been reliable. The folks who've been there have always been there. They've always been reliable. This also gets back to belonging and identity. And in a world that is as is changing as fast as ours is and is as alarming as ours is and as fragmented as ours is, This idea that there's one thing, one place where we can go and escape that, and it's not going to change, and we've got to make sure it doesn't because we need this. This gets back to that sky is falling. We have to make sure the sky doesn't fall, and so we have to make sure that we're not driving people away. Would you hand Jessica the microphone so that you can say that for all the folks at home? home. I said, but that's the issue, that the institution itself was never supposed to be the focus of our safety and security. It's God that doesn't change. It's a matter of some confused allegiances. The subject matter we think should stay out of the pulpit is the subject matter that is polarizing people and (laughs) driving people to terrible extremes out there. We don't want that in here. Here's the problem. By completely disengaging from those things at church, we are neglecting the very mission fields that Christ calls us to enter. So a way of thinking of this that um, makes, makes perfect sense to me, hopefully it will translate, is table manners. Okay, you've got 
Uncle Steve, tree hugging, you know, dope smoking Uncle Steve over here on this side of the Thanksgiving table. And you've got Aunt Eileen with her NRA membership card and her pro-life stance over here. You have to avoid those subjects or somebody is going to die. Or at the very least, Aunt Eileen's not going to come back or Uncle Steve's not going to come back for Thanksgiving next year and we love them. We want them to be here. We are going to agree to either disagree or we're not going to touch this subject matter. These are agreements that families make. The church (laughs) is not a family sitting around the table enjoying Thanksgiving dinner, folks. Minding our manners is not what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus also doesn't call us to be jerks about this stuff. But making nice is not the church's mission. Making peace is the church's mission. And in places where there is peace, whether it's the peace that surpasses understanding or the peace of mutual agreement that we are not going to talk about this stuff, where peace already is, peacemaking is not necessary. Peacemaking is necessary where there is conflict, where there is rupture. We have to go there. If we don't go there, we are failing to reckon with things that destroy us. They destroy our spirit and they destroy cultures and countries. Entering into conflict is the only way the church can reckon with societal sins. And we might not agree about which of those societal sins are the most, um, the most uh, urgent. But we have to all agree that as a culture, we've got some reckoning to do. The church has to enter in to issues that divide us. Not even in a way that takes a position necessarily one over the other, although I think at some point you have to do that, but in a loving way, in a way that acknowledges that everybody around the table is arguing about this stuff because this stuff matters enormously. How do we at the church, as the church, listen for what people are really, really afraid of? And in the little bit of listening that I'm able to do. I have very small ears and a really big mouth. Um, What I hear over and over and over is, I'm afraid for the future of our church. I'm afraid that the values that have benefited me and my family in this country are going to go away. These are real, honest-to-God fears that the church needs to minister to, and we can't do it if we won't enter into it. We need to reckon, I think, above all, with competing loyalties. There's a principle in advertising that says everything speaks. Everything speaks. This picture on the left, I believe, was taken on January 6th. And it breaks my heart when I see it because of the confusion of allegiances. The picture on the right, I took last week. These flags are hanging over one of the churches in my town. These flags could be hanging over the churches in this order in any of our towns. What is speaking there? What is speaking there? There is a message in how those flags 
are displayed. It's the little itty bitty consolation prize of a Christian flag. Yeah. It's physically smaller and it's on the bottom. This may not be what this church intends the message to be. That's pretty loud. <laughs> and as leaders of the church, we need to be looking at these things with a critical, not a cruel, but a critical eye. Does our messaging match what we say we belong to? So in Acts, oops, at the beginning of Acts, Jesus is about to ascend and he's delivering his parting remarks with his, with his disciples. This is what you've heard from me, John baptized with water. Here we're back again at baptism as the sign and seal of this belonging to Christ. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, the disciples asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They are still, even after the resurrection, they're still thinking, this is all about getting the Romans off our back. Yeah. And Jesus says, Guys, I'm obviously paraphrasing here. Guys, it's not for you to know the times or period that the Father has set by his own authority. But as I mentioned before, you will, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. First in Jerusalem, then in Israel as a whole, Judea and Samaria, and then unto the entire world world. This is where allegiance to Christ is meant to go. And so N.T. Wright, who is one of my favorites, um, in this book, The Day the Revolution Began, no, Reconsidering the Meaning of Jesus' Crucifixion, he writes this, what might it look like for the kingdom to be restored to Israel? So N.T. Wright, in most of this book, is looking to what some of these um, images and faith claims that we have, how they would have resonated and been heard by the people at the time that they were written, which is a completely different cultural context, and so it requires some translation. So of the period, many Jews faced with that question would have said that restoring the kingdom depends on three things. First, Get the Romans off our back. We have to be set free from the domination of pagan overlords. And this is exactly the theme that we see in the story of the Exodus when Israel is, is uh, delivered from the domination of those pagan overlords and when we see Israel um, taken into exile to Babylon, then they are liberated by the Persians when the Persians go in and mop the floor with the Babylonians and return to Israel. There's this, there's this very consistent idea in Israel's understanding of their covenant with God that has to do with deliverance and these abusive, tyrannical powers being removed by God. Whoops, sorry, I, got, I was going to stop doing that. Um, second, Israel's God would become the ruler of the whole world. And what that rule would accomplish is setting all things to rights. Justice, peace, mercy. Everything that God intends for human society to be will be accomplished when God is Lord. And then finally, God's own presence would come to dwell with the people of God, enabling them to worship fully and truly. Now we're talking about the Spirit of God here. But in the context of Israel's story, we are also talking about some things that need to be challenged and some things that need to be corrected about the way human beings structure 
our societies. When we try to preserve other allegiances, the full and true worship of God is impossible. Full and true worship of God is uncontaminated by any other allegiance. And that is really, really hard. That is really hard. When we try to preserve other allegiances, our worship of God starts to contract and get very small. And it becomes something that, um, that I think of as play it safe worship. And so what is play it safe worship? What does this look like? Self-focused, individualistic, and personal. Now, we good Presbyterians, we reformed Protestants, have, I think, a more, um, a more developed sensibility about the importance of our salvation as something that happens together, communal. But there's still this powerful, powerful theological narrative in our country that salvation is something that happens to you individually when you are right with Jesus. Very individualistic. And it's hard, even in our Presbyterian sort of milieu, to get away from that powerful, individualistic, very American, frankly, cultural narrative that salvation is about me. Play a safe worship keeps things on schedule. So, okay, who has any experience with this? I attended a church once where the, um, the, the secretary and the pastor weren't on the greatest of terms, and the secretary would sit in the very front pew, the only Presbyterian I ever saw who did this, sit in the very front pew, and when the pastor was running long, the secretary would hold up her watch like this so that everybody in the congregation <laughs> could see. It was awesome. Um, yeah, it was so funny. Right? I know, I know, yeah. I mean, at least she wasn't walking out, and, and I have seen that happen too. You know, we get to the 60-minute mark, and, you know, now I'm done. So, yeah, and then also, our play at safe worship, and I love this about us, because obviously I love words on a page, but, oh, golly, can Presbyterians worship without a bulletin? Oh, my gosh, it's like Linus and his blanket, for me, anyway. Um... Play it safe worship does not encroach upon society beyond the church walls. What, what happens in worship stays in worship. <laughs> Play it safe worship makes us feel good about ourselves. I come to church so that I will feel better. And I get that. I get this gets to the comment we had over here about we don't want to hear a gospel of hopelessness. That's not the gospel anyway. But when our worship resembles, oh golly, what's the guy? A Tony Robbins seminar. <laughs> More than it does the Sermon on the Mount. We, we are off track. Play it safe worship, as we said before, avoids controversy. And this is really important in play it safe worshiper worship we are more afraid of offending our fellow churchgoers than we are of offending God. And worship cannot be faithful, and allegiance cannot be total if our message isn't true. And some of the truths that we have to wrestle with are difficult and painful, and we push back against them because they attack us where we live right here in our ego and our self-concept, and that can be very difficult. Um, this is very contained. This is very tidy. It's very controlled. It's very conformist. And this is worship that caters to our need for comfort and convenience. And in that respect, it might be more worship of ourselves 
than worship of the living God. Mark Laberton, in his book, The Dangerous Act of Worship, after which today's presentation is named, he writes this. We've been made in re- for relationship with God, so it's not surprising that we long to meet and know God, but the God we seek is the God we want, not the God who is. We fashion a God who blesses without obligation, lets us feel God's presence without living God's life, who stands with us and never against us, who gives us what we want when we want it. We worship a God of consumer satisfaction, which is so American. And then he goes on to say, We confess Jesus is Lord, but we only submit to the part of Christ's authority that submits to, that fits to our grand personal designs, which I'm not saying aren't wonderful, but doesn't cause pain, doesn't disrupt the American dream, doesn't draw us across ethnic or racial divisions, doesn't add the pressure of too much guilt, certainly doesn't mean forgiving as we have been forgiven, and doesn't ask for more than a check to show compassion. Safe worship keeps us safely within the confines of a world that really doesn't care what we do with our religion as long as we do not upset the ruling status quo. So, the early Christian martyrs, uh, the Christian martyrs during the Roman era, you know they weren't put together, or put together, put to death. They may have been very put together, who knows. Um, They weren't put to death for worshiping Christ. Roman government couldn't have cared less who anybody worshipped. That's one of the things that made it very successful and very possible for them to expand into as many different cultural areas as they did. You could worship a tree root. You could worship the stuff under your toenail. They didn't care as long as you also worshipped the emperor. You paid your, you showed your allegiance to Caesar by worshiping Caesar. Worship Jesus, we don't care, that's fine, no problem. But you will also worship Caesar. Now, as I understand it, Judaism had a bit of a pass where this was concerned. Because the Roman government recognized that this monotheism business, if they wanted a happy Jewish colony of people. They needed to accommodate that. So there was some sort of arrangement with Jews. But these Christian upstarts were saying, no, Christianity was a new religion. <laughs> for, all, for what we're looking as, you know, pagan pantheists, they, they've come up with another god. This isn't monotheistic. Why can't they worship Caesar as well? That's why the early Christian martyrs died. So our true religion is all about God reordering human society. And we know this from the Beatitudes. The meek shall inherit the earth. The poor have the best seat at Christ's table. Those reviled and cast out for their allegiance to Christ, these ones are the blessed and the exalted. Christ shows how really truly pitiful human powers of imperialism are by reordering the laws of the universe that say that what is dead stays dead. No human system of power can stand up against that. Earthly powers do not want to have to manage people who believe that about the world. Earthly power does not want to have to manage people who are not impressed by earthly power. Earthly powers don't want to manage people who expect a world of justice and mercy and peace. Justice and mercy and peace undermine the human will to dominate. And dangerous worship is worship in which we give glory to God for this re 
ordering of the ways that, left to our own devices, we want to order the world. So what is dangerous worship? Did you have a question? I was just going to say, and, and Christ's understanding of peace was different than the Romans because they wanted peace at all costs, and yet the Christians, Jesus and the Christians, are saying slaves are the same as free, men are the same as equal to women, and, 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 yeah. and Caesar's equal to the lowest slave, and they yeah. wouldn't put up with that. Exactly. So... Um, Christ's, oh, you know what? I'm not going to say it right. W- would you hand her the, the microphone? We just need to pass the microphone around when you guys speak. Um, will you say that again? Oh, you that, can say it better than I do. That, that Jesus, Jesus and the Christians saw peace in a different way than the Romans did. Romans wanted peace, everybody to behave nice and stay in their place. But Christ taught and the Christians taught that in Christ there is no slave or free, no Jew, no Gentile, no men or women. We're all equal under God, and even Caesar would fall into that, that Caesar was equal to the lowest slave, and um, uh, Rome didn't like that. No. <laughs> no. Not even I, a little bit. <laughs> and I would suggest that today we don't like that. No. That is a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, the Pax Romana, yeah, peace could be yours as long as you followed all of Rome's rules. And that's not the peace of Christ. That's not the peace that surpasses understanding. That's peace that's achieved through coercion and fear, not through allegiance and an agreement in people's heart of hearts that peace is better than disunity and discord and violence and tyranny. So what does dangerous worship look like? Dangerous worship is Jesus-centered. And it's not me-centered, it's we-centered. We are in this together because we are allegiant to one Lord. That means we don't only belong to him, we belong to one another. Maximizes opportunities for encountering the living God. This not only means creating some room for the Holy Spirit to move in unscheduled ways during our scheduled worship on Sundays. This means opportunities for encountering God in places that aren't a church building. Encountering God at the park, encountering God at work, encountering God over coffee with a neighbor. Dangerous worship calls us to lose our lives in order to save them. Helps us name and limit abuses of power within ourselves because we are all, we are all culpable. This this is the nature of human sin. Abuses of power within ourselves and within the world. Enters into controversy, not by being confrontational, but by being very much centered in who we are in Christ, and Christ is Lord, entering in with curiosity, bigger ears than mouths. Courageously, it takes guts, to go into these places, and also with compassion. I should have put that up there as well. And because, because we are Christ-centered and not us-centered, because we are committing to his purposes and his plans and his timeline and his outcomes, we don't have to be as scared anymore to have these conversations. And so dangerous worship is where we can confidently and eagerly embrace these conversations and enter into what actually matters in the world. And we know what matters in the world because what matters in the world is what 
is hurting people. Sometimes physically, sometimes economically, often in their spirits. This is just a completely unreadable because the uh, print is too small. Those last two slides side by side. Would somebody look up Acts 2, please? All right. Would you, let's get you the, the mic. Oh, excuse me, reach across the head. There you go. Will you read this depiction of the early church's true and full worship, Acts 2, 45 through 47, please? Okay, all three at once? All three at once. Okay. Yeah. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Kingdom allegiance is radically generous. And mutually supportive. It's a daily practice, not a weekly event. Acts isn't saying, and then on Saturday, they went over to synagogue, and then after they were done there, they went and had chicken dinner. No, not that they didn't. But this is something that is being braided into their daily lives. Social commitment, we've talked about that before. It encompasses everyday life. Breaking bread, this is having lunch. This is having omelets for breakfast. Oh gosh, we didn't even review what people don't want to eat. We'll get to that. Um, expressing gratitude and goodwill. Not their own gratitude and goodwill, but the gratitude and goodwill of people outside the fellowship. This is starting to, this is starting to bubble over. And it is transformative and fruitful. Every day, God, every day, God was adding to their numbers. God was calling more people to be allegiant to Christ. Before we wrap up, I just want to, I just want to sort of take the temperature of the group. In one word... How are you feeling about all of this at this point? Inspired. Inspired. Hopeful. Introspective. Introspective. I was just going to say that. You beat me to it. Wondering. Wondering. Anybody feeling a little tense back here and in your shoulders? Anybody feeling a little tense right here? And what that is, is consumer Christianity. I'm going I'm to believe in Jesus, and then Jesus is going to make everything better for me. And Jesus himself says, that's not the deal. That's not the deal. And yet, and yet, those who lose their lives will save them. And lose their lives, yes, we can take that literally. But I think that... Um, I think that for most of us that lose their lives is losing our attachments to the world being the way we want it to be 
and need it to be and think it has to be and other people being the way we think they should be. It's those confused allegiances that have to die in us and that's, that's a hard death. It's hard to let go of those things. We spend so much of our lives um, being the people we think we're supposed to be because we want to belong. We want to belong. We want to recognize ourselves when we look in the mirror. What if we looked in the mirror and saw Jesus? I can't even imagine that <laughs> for myself, but wouldn't that be interesting? We need to let go of the church as we want it to be, as we think it should be, as we remember it always was, but it actually wasn't. Um, We need to let go of our grip on what reality and life and people and God are supposed to be and supposed to deliver. So to wrap this up, Again, Mark Laberton from The Dangerous Act of Worship says this, if human spiritual transformation were easy, it would not have required the cross or the resurrection or the gift of the Spirit. But these gifts have been given. These gifts have been given to us as goofy as we are, as stubborn as we are, as sinful as we are, as forgetful as we are. These gifts have been given, and they are ours as part of that citizenship agreement with our Lord. I I think that just about every gospel message can be connected back to a U2 song, and I'm not even that big of a fan of U2, but I wanted to share with you... um, just a few lines from you two song summer rain when you stop seeing beauty you start growing old the lines on your face are a map to your soul when you stop taking chances you'll stay where you sit you won't live any longer but it'll feel like it it's not why you're running it's where you're going it's not what you're dreaming but what you're gonna do It's not where you're born. It's where you belong. It's not how weak, but what will make you strong. So take that into conversation over lunch. Uh, All right, so this part three, we're going to take a look at where this true and full worship of God uh, intersects with what is happening in culture. So to begin with, we'll turn again to Mark Laberton, The Dangerous Act of Worship. In its unexpected and power-inverting way, the sacrificial love of God in Christ crucified recasts all forms of power. That's the work and meaning of the cross Our worship helps us remember this power realignment. That power realignment is an important phrase to keep in mind. So we can live differently because of it. All right. And here's the challenge. Middle class American churches typically identify with the culture, which makes sense because in many respects we help to build it. So there's little desire or demand to question power. Since the systems of our culture work for us, we readily believe in the general benevolence of government or education or commerce or welfare or justice. I did it again. Foo. Okay. We're down at this inoculates us. (laughs) Against facing or engaging issues of power abuse in the world. (laughs) 
Okay, okay. And then these words. The words of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. I know your works. You're neither hot, you're not cold. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. This, I think, is the, this, I think, is the great challenge and temptation of the American middle class church. Listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. But that happens on his terms, not on ours. Let anyone with an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to our churches. Cold, hot, and lukewarm are figures of speech, obviously. And they mean against me, for me, or loyal to me, or indifferent to me. Those who are against Christ often commandeer the loyalties of those who are, give me two seconds, who are indifferent to Christ. Or if not indifferent to Christ, they are not loyal to Christ above all else. And we heard about that this morning in the example from Rwanda, we're about to look at a different example. Christine. I think it's a really great scripture to raise not only the point that you're making, but also to realize that there are churches probably more numerous. Yes, yes, the microphone. We want the folks at home. We want the folks at home to hear y'all's Boy. wisdom. There are churches and Christians probably more numerous than in our denomination who would read this exact same passage and say, see, we are righteous, we follow God's word to the letter. The lukewarm are not those who are rich or prospered. They're the Presbyterians and those mainline Christians who don't take the Bible seriously and whom God will spit out of his mouth. Mm-hmm. And don't think I'm making this up. I'm quoting word for word what my childhood pastor taught to his church of 5,000. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, maybe that's something that we need to maybe that's something that we need to ask ourselves. To what extent does allegiance to Jesus Christ require us to demonize other Christians? Is that allegiance to one Lord? When we say that others, Christians, other baptized Christians, other church-going Christians are not allegiant in the right way or allegiant enough. Here's another example of competing loyalties. The Barman Declaration. In our... Presbyterian Book of Confessions, this is the first of four 20th century confessions. Now, the Declaration, or not the Declaration, the Confession of Belhar wasn't accepted into the Book of Confessions until this century, but it was developed in the late 1980s. But this one, this one comes out of the 1930s. Now, let's think about the 1930s globally. We're still less than a generation out from World War I, which radically, radically destabilized Europe. Much of the world, Europe and the United States included, are in the throes of the Great Depression. Things are not good economically. Things are very unsettled politically. And people are scared. And people are angry. And people are looking for a sense of safety, a sense of security, and a sense of place and belonging in the world. And people are always ready to rise to that challenge. 
1933, this is a picture from early in 1933, right after Hitler was elected lawfully chancellor, on the nationalist, National Socialist Platform. That platform began with a statement demanding union of all Germans into, I quote, a greater Germany. One year after this election, Seven hundred thousand Nazi sympathizers, seven hundred thousand Nazi sympathizers showed up for one of the Nuremberg rallies. And this really scared a lot of people, and it should have. In Germany at this time, there are about sixty million Germans. About two-thirds of them identified as Protestant, most of them church-going. The other third, most of them identified as Roman Catholic, also church-going. This rally, therefore, is overwhelmingly comprised of church-going Christians. How does something like this happen? It happens when the social order feels very insecure and unstable. It happens when people don't know how they're going to pay the bills. It happens when people are feeling deep, deep shame. And the German people had had a lot of shaming imposed upon them coming out of World War I by the national community. And so the Nazis come into this. They come into this in the early to mid-1920s with this message. We will save you. We will make this better for you. The Nazis spun a philosophy. Um, Actually, the Nazis didn't. Nazi sympathizers Christian sympathizers with the Nazi platform, spun a philosophy called positive Christianity. And positive Christianity derived from item number 24 of the Nazi party platform. They had 25 points on their platform. This was number 24. We demand freedom for all religious denominations in the state, provided, and that didn't include Judaism, provided they do not threaten its existence nor offend the moral feelings of the German race. We don't want anybody to feel bad. Let's not, no, 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 no. We can't have people feel bad. Unless, of course, they're not counted as members of the German race. As many millions of them were not. So what does not, what does positive, okay, so there's this group of Christians um, who style themselves the German Christians, and they use this article from the Nazi party platform as their springboard. Not, positive Christianity, as you would expect, was nationalistic, anti-Semitic, pro-Aryan, all of this stuff that we associated, associate with the Nazi party. So what do they consider negative? These German Christians who are embracing positive Christianity. Jesus' miraculous birth, his suffering, his sacrifice on the cross, and his resurrection. Now you might ask yourself, how, how, how are we still talking about Jesus here if these are considered negative? Well, in this respect... We've got German Christians very confused about what is gospel and what is Nietzsche. What is left? Jesus as orator. Jesus as organizer. Jesus as Jew hater. Jesus as fighter. Jesus as war hero. Who are we describing? We're describing Hitler. This was the Jesus of German positive Christianity. 
during the Third Reich. And of course, the Bible doesn't support this view of Jesus, so the German Christians edited the Bible. They got rid of the Old Testament, they removed all references in the New Testament to Jesus' Jewish ancestry, no more son of David. They removed all Jewish names and places, all quotations from the Old Testament, except any that they thought made the Jews look bad. And all references to Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled by Jesus. Because of course those Old Testament prophecies are all about God setting up a completely different kind of order. So this segment of the German church-going population, the German Christians, hitched their wagon to the Third Reich. The Reich was more than happy to make use of them. And these German Christians made sure that they got on their local church boards and ousted anybody who opposed the Reich. And this went as far as a, um, oh golly, I can't even remember what it was called now. Hang on just a second. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, uh, getting a law passed that said that anybody of Jewish descent could not serve on a church staff. You couldn't sweep the floors. You couldn't man the phones. You certainly couldn't preach. If you were a Christian of Jewish descent, the German ch Christians got rid of all of those voices in their churches. In 1933, oh, wait, let me show you the German Christian movement's flag. I think it speaks for itself. In 1933, the German Christians held a conference and they came up with this resolution, and this is quoted in, this is a great book, Presbyterian Creeds, A Guide to the Book of Confessions by Jack Rogers. And it said this, and I'll read it because that is microscopic. God has created me a German. Germanism is a gift of God. God wants me to fight for my Germany. Military service is in no sense a violation of Christian conscience, but is obedience to God. The believer possesses the right of revolution against a state that furthers the powers of darkness. He also has this right in the face of a church board that does not unreservedly acknowledge the exaltation of the nation. For a German, the church is a fellowship of believers who are obligated to fight for a Christian Germany. The goal of the faith movement of German Christians is an evangelical German Reich church. And in the introduction, in our book of confessions, to the theological declaration of Barman, most Germans took the union of Christianity, nationalism, and militarism for granted, and patriotic sentiments were equated with Christian truth. The German Christians exalted the racially pure nation and the rule of Hitler as God's will for the German people. With Nazis and German Christians on one side, God's faithful remnant arose in Germany. First as the emergency covenant of pastors and then is the confessing church. The confessing church's aim at first had nothing to do with um, calling out the Reich's sin of anti-Semitism. Didn't have anything to say about that in the beginning. In the beginning, what they were concerned about was they wanted the state out of the church's business. And they also needed to present a united front. And the Declaration of Barman was the confessional statement that they believed would demonstrate their anti-Nazi consensus. And when I say they, I mean Lutheran, Reformed, and United Church pastors who were opposed 
to the policies of the Third Reich, but weren't quite ready yet, weren't quite ready yet to come up against him on the Jewish question. They were led by Reformed theologian Karl Barth. And we're going to walk through, just really quickly, this statement about the proper alignment of earthly power that these folks came up with in 1934. As members of the Lutheran Reformed and United Churches, we may and must speak with one voice in this matter today. We may not keep silent since we believe we have been given a common message to utter in a time of common need and temptation. The Barman Declaration puts forward six theological points that speak to allegiance and the proper alignment of power. The first one, Jesus Christ, as he is attested in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and death. In other words, there is no other source of revelation for the church besides Christ Jesus our Lord. Number two, as Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of our sins, so also he is God's claim upon our entire life. This pulls us back into that baptism identity that we have. Through him befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world. There is no area of life in which we belong to lords other than Jesus. And this is in response to the assertion of German Christians that you know, don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> that's, that's got nothing to do with us. And the confessing church is saying, oh yeah, it does. The Christian church, this is point number three, is the church of pardoned sinners, has to testify in the midst of a sinful world with its faith as with its obedience or allegiance, with its message as with its order, that it is solely Christ's property, that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and his direction. No matter how safe we think earthly powers can make us, we acknowledge that only Christ is our comfort. Only Christ is our security. Only Christ is our salvation. We will not abandon our message and mission to please ourselves or align with prevailing ideologies or political convictions. Point number four. This is where they're speaking to those German Christians getting themselves elected to church boards and then messing with things. The various offices in the church do not establish a dominion of some over the others. On the contrary, they're for the exercise of the ministry entrusted to and enjoined upon the whole congregation. So we've got these Reformed pastors and theologians, we've got these Lutheran pastors and theologians, these united pastors and theologians, and they are all on board with the priesthood of all believers. And they're claiming that. This is the part where they are claiming the responsibility of the entire company of living saints. <laughs> Point number five, the state has, by divine appointment, the task of providing for justice and peace by means of the threat and exercise of force according to the measure of human judgment and human ability. They are giving the state its due here, and this point number five was a point of considerable controversy between those who were drafting the Barman Declaration. Martin Luther held that the state has its sphere of influence and affairs, and the church has its sphere of influence and affairs, and one shall not 
transgress the sphere of the other. It's a very Lutheran idea, and it is the idea that prevailed here. A more reformed idea would be that these are two spheres that keep an eye on each other, that check one another, that can support one another, but should not be consolidated. And then finally, number six, the church's commission consists in delivering the message of the free grace of God to all people in Christ's stead. And therefore, in the ministry of his own word and work through sermon and sacrament, the church and its ministries will not be subordinated to any earthly desires, purposes, or plans. Hitler hands off. Any questions or comments? Christine. Down at the bottom. I can imagine that. You might have to hold it until it turns green. On the, the, and, then the and then you can just leave it on. Okay. okay. What's it doing? I don't know. Oh! oh! Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe I'm being silenced. No. Um, I could imagine if I was a Christian who was in file and rank behind Hitler, that I would look at Karl Barth and the Confessing Church as being lukewarm. Because they're not yes. ready to go to war over the things they believe. And yet, mm -hmm. if not out and out cold, these people are, are actively hostile. Yes, that's a fair point. And why do we say that the confessing church was right and the German Christians were wrong? Because we're on their side, because we won. But that's the temptation. That's the temptation. Mm -hmm. Now, ultimately, um, many of the leaders of the confessing church would wind up giving a lot more than this statement. Martin Niemöller spent several years in a concentration camp. He was arrested, I believe, in 1937. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was not really, as I understand it, part of the initial group of people crafting this, um, but, but did get involved later. He was hanged two weeks before, I believe, um, Germany surrendered. There were prices to be paid for these things. But I think for us, most of us aren't going to be called to sacrifice in those ways. I think for us, when we're thinking about lukewarm Christianity, we need to think about rank-and-file Christians who maybe were very much opposed to this government overreach, to the atrocities of Nazism. They were scared to death for good reason, and they decided not to enter into the conflict. We're just, we're just going to let it take care of itself. That, to me, is what lukewarm Christianity is. Because the allegiance to Christ, their allegiance to Christ, their commitment to that allegiance is what led these church leaders into the fray. And we are those leaders. You guys, we are those leaders. What does the church look like? Oh, wait, we got another... Another quote from Revelation. I love Revelation. This is Jesus again. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. I know you can't tolerate evildoers. You've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them to be false. Go team. I also know you're enduring patiently and bearing up 
for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. They will know we are Christians by our love. Jesus is not talking about Valentine's Day sentimentality, and neither is that song. He's talking about commitment. He's talking about allegiance. He's talking about devotion to the one Lord. This is what church looks like at its most confused. Nearly 100% of Germans identified as Christian. Most of them were church-going. Now, what are they doing here? They're pledging allegiance to a lawfully elected government. Nobody's breaking any laws here. We've got some very sad, sad looking Catholic priests over off to the side, but their hands are up too. This is confused Christian loyalties at its very, very worst. And what we might be seeing here is going along to get along. Let's go back to that flag of the German Christian movement for just a second. Lest we think that this kind of confusion is a relic of the past or something that is the something that is the exclusive province of extremists and wackos and take your label whatever you want i ask you to consider this all available on etsy let's go to etsy you can find a million of these all different kinds, all different sizes. The cross of Christ festooned with the red, white, and blue of the United States. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be grateful for our citizenship in this country. I'm not saying that it's not valuable and that it shouldn't be defended. But we've got some examples of confused alliances here. And these kinds of confused alliances, I would argue, particularly where political party is concerned in our country, are tearing our churches apart. These Red, white, and blue crosses available on Etsy are no doubt made by people who love Jesus and their country and do not know which allegiance matters more. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Jesus said to that early, early, early church, So really, there is nothing new under the sun, and I always take some comfort from that. We've been dealing with this sort of thing for 2,000 years, and we are still here, because the kingdom that we belong to is on the timeline of eternity. Repentance, which is the practice of turning back to God every time we stray. Repentance is the antidote to that lost love, that lost allegiance. And finding ourselves forgiven, finding ourselves freed from the the shame and the guilt and the feeling of powerlessness that can weigh on us so incredibly heavily, we are capable of extraordinary acts, extraordinary acts of reconciliation. The Barman Declaration, written in 1934, was an inspiring and foundational document for our American Confession of 1967. What was happening in 1967 in this country? 
Vietnam, civil rights. Yeah, oh, who's there another one? Rise of feminism, Cold War, Space Race. <laughs> Very volatile little decade, the 1960s. People were feeling it. Churches were feeling it. And this confession of 1967 is one of two American contributions to our book of confessions. This is the first of the two. The second is the not-so-brief statement of faith, which was composed when the Northern Church and the Southern Church, Presbyterian churches, after well over 100 years of division because of the Civil War, finally came back together in the 1980s. So reconciliation comes out of these incredibly disrupted times when people allegiant to God step up and make that allegiance known and live into it and respond to his call and his will. Let's get you in. Um, in twenty eighteen, there was a declaration by a number of Christian leaders. Christian leaders in America called Reclaiming Jesus. Mm. Um, and basically it was a response to the um, conflation again um, during that period and continuing of patriotism and, and Christian faith. Mm -hmm. The Reclaiming Jesus movement. I am not familiar with that. I will look that up. Jim Wallace from Sojourners was one of the oh, Jim uh, authors. West, Wesley Michelson. Um, okay. Some of those people. Okay. Another thing that came out of, um, didn't come out of, but uh, look to the Barman Declaration for inspiration and example was the Confession of Belhar. It's the only confession at the moment in our book of confessions that originates somewhere outside of Western, Northern Hemisphere culture. It's from South Africa. It was put together in the late 1980s as a response to apartheid, the entrenched state-sanctioned injustices of apartheid. That is our newest confession, and I don't know very much about it, which is why I'm not going to talk about it a lot. But it is absolutely worth a look. Because if anything, it shows us that there isn't anything new under the sun. Because folks is folks all over the world. And that should be, I think, I'll get the microphone for you. That should be, I think, a bit of an encouragement to us because part of our allegiance to Christ means that we serve a Lord who is never going to let us go. The Confession of Belhar uh, is unity in the church and reconciliation. And the final three words of the Confession of Belhar are Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Despite sometimes all evidence to the contrary. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Randy. So to wrap this session up, Words of Jesus, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is at the point of death, for I have found your works incomplete in the sight of my God. Remember then 
what you received and heard, obey it and return to God. This return language is about repentance. The word that we translate as repentance in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, my Hebrew is terrible, so I can't tell you what the word is, but in Greek, the word is metanoia. It's the word that we get words like metamorphosis from. Literally, what it means is to turn around, to turn back, to reorient, to correct the course. And the idea when we're using it in terms of repentance in our Judeo-Christian tradition is this turning back to God because the temptation to stray, the temptation to listen to the interesting little devil on our shoulders, the temptation to listen to whatever the serpent's telling us is always there. It's always, always there. And so is God. The invitation to turn back if we have to do it 70 times seven times a day, is always there. We will never turn back and not find God there. Let anyone with an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So in 1984, the 196th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, Reverend Leopold Esselbach of South Africa Um, not South Africa, of Germany, sorry, getting confused, of Germany, said this in his address to the assembly. The clergy and laity confess Jesus Christ as Lord of the whole world and their lives, but most members of the church still thought it possible to combine their Christian faith with German nationalism. We are mindful that our Protestant churches share in the guilt of those times, and we must humble ourselves before the judgment of God Today, the Barman Declaration confronts us with the question, what are the heresies and temptations of our world so that we may not fall into them? What are the heresies and temptations of our world so that we may not fall into them? That is the question that we as a group are going to tackle starting at 2 o'clock. Okay, um, I'm trying to think of where I want to, let's do this. Um, okay, so how many of you have or have seen, <laughs> they're everywhere at Hobby Lobby, those, those little plaque things that say, be still and know. Be still and know. Do you have one of them? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have, have one of those, be still and know in some form or another? So, sometimes they put it on coffee cups, which I think is really ironic. <laughs> be still. Okay, so you might want to plug your ears because I'm about to completely ruin that for you. So it's a lovely sentiment, be still and know that I am God. And then there's that little prayer, be still and know, be still and know that. Be still and, be still, be which is wonderful advice, and we can all use it, and we all probably should, well, okay, me, I need to do that more. But that is a total misappropriation of Psalm 46, which is what it comes from. Psalm 46 is a strident political psalm, a political psalm that puts human power in its place. In that psalm, in the context of that psalm, it is not be still and know that I am God. It is be still and know that I am God. There needs to be lots of exclamation points around that. This is why context is really important. A better way of praying that would be, be still and know that I am God. Still know that I am God. Know that I am God. I am God. 
It's a prayer with a different kind of comfort than the validation that we should just be, which is absolutely what we should do. I'm not arguing that. But we do have a tendency in our very individualistic American society to center ourselves, which is a human uh, temptation everywhere, but we have, we have raised it to an art form. So part of our work as leaders of Christ's church is to recenter Jesus in everything that we do. Let's, let's, let's go back to that charming German Christian flag. If you take a look at a crucifix, which of course is a cross with the body of Jesus actually on it, the, the heart of Jesus is right over those cross beams. That is absolutely not <laughs> what we're seeing here. Absolutely not what we're seeing here. What, oh, whoops, no wonder I'm struggling here. I've got the wrong, and that was last. Oh my gosh, okay, now it has fallen apart. Hang on just a second. I've got notes somewhere. I put them on the Lord's table. Be still, right? (laughs) This is where that really helps. Yeah. Okay. Anything... that confessing Christians do or say that fails to center Christ and instead elevates something like this to the center is idolatry. And before we panic, idolatry is the oldest of human sins. What is the sin of Adam and Eve? believing that it would be better to be God than to be gods. You won't die. You'll be like God. You'll know good from evil. You won't die. <laughs> that's, that's the voice of the serpent that's never really gone away. So this is something that as human beings we contend with. This is the great temptation of the one creature that we know of made in the image of God and yet bearing this mortal flesh. We want to be God. We feel like we're so close to it. And so this is the temptation to center ourselves and that is idolatry. Here's something to know about the sin of idolatry. It is a sin, a sin that is unique to God's people because essentially it is a sin of betrayal. People who are not in relationship with God cannot commit the sin of idolatry. So this belongs to us, and I think that a lot of times we tend, um, we tend to think of idolatry as people who worship gods other than, other than God. So we throw Muslims and those, you know, toe fungus worshipers in the Roman Empire and, you know, all of those, mm -mm. Mm -mm, that's their deal. Idolatry Idolatry is what we have to contend with because we are called to be allegiant to this one Lord. Our proper Christian worship, our true and full worship, is a wall-to-wall reminder to us and a testimony to anybody on the outside watching that Christ is our Lord and we will serve no other. And that is, that is a frightening assertion for a lot of people to hear because people are scared. People are scared, they are uncertain, they see the world as they know it, or perhaps would prefer it, is, is falling apart, is not shaping up. They are struggling with very real day-to-day things, not to mention all of the scary stuff we're seeing on the news all the time. 
and they want it to be fixed, and they want it to be fixed now. And Adolf Hitler was not the only person to step up and say, I will save you. Jesus told us that this would happen all the time. It was happening all the time in his time. The powers of the world are also standing there threatening anybody who doesn't follow them and who doesn't pledge allegiance to them. And that compounds the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the dread, the despair of people who are already struggling, who are already anxious, who are already worried and discouraged. So how do we, and this gets to your question, You would think by now I had figured this out. Okay. Come on now. There we go. How do we, as leaders of Christ's church, recenter Jesus and jettison whatever idols have gotten lodged in the heart of us and in the heart of our churches that isn't Jesus? How do we do that? That is the million dollar question. I think that there are some steps that we can mindfully take. The first one being repentance. Turning back to God, turning it back to God, very intentionally recentering our focus on God. And folks, we are doing that here right now. This is church. This is worship. We are doing that, of course, when we're getting together on Sunday mornings, recentering ourselves in Christ intentionally. That's good. That's exactly what we're to be doing. How do we do that at work? How do we do that with our families? How do we do that? when we're sitting there in the waiting room at the doctor's office. This is the pastoral call that is upon all leaders of the church. So repentance, turning back to God in ways that we don't even think about as repentance and turning back to God. That's one thing. And after repentance, I think we have to do some fearless moral inventory, as 12-step programs call it, or as we are more inclined to call it, spend some time in confession. Confessing the sins of our culture, of our church, and of ourselves. So we're going to spend a few minutes practicing that confession. And to do that, we need a couple of definitions. The question that um, the guy at the 196th General Assembly posed was what heresies and temptations of our world are most perilous? How do we avoid them? So what are those heresies and temptations? We got we to gotta define those two terms. A heresy is a philosophical assertion that decenters Christ from the worship and conduct of life of Christ's people. So a heresy is not um, so and so watches too much football. A heresy would be football will save you. Football will set you free. That's that's the level we're talking about. And then the temptations are the actions that decenter Christ from the worship and conduct of life of Christ's people. Remember, what this exercise is, is it's an exercise of confession. This is something that we are offering God for ourselves and on behalf of the people whom God has called us to lead. 
So let's, let's just share this conversation as, as a group. Where's the, here we go. <clears throat> what are some of your thoughts? What heresies and temptations do you think most threaten our church's allegiance to our Lord? I know you don't want to. I know you don't want to do this, but you guys have good things to contribute, and I want the folks at home no to hear you. I got no problem with the microphone. <laughs> um, you were talking. I mean, obviously, we we're talking earlier about um, the Christian nation, uh, and was thinking about you know growing up. We always prayed. You know, thankful that we live in a nation that we are allowed to worship freely. Okay. And so what I think may have happened at any time during this country's existence, uh, uh, but a lot in recent years, is that prayer becomes as important as worship. In other words, I can't worship unless, I mean, it's because of the country that I am allowed to worship instead of it's because of my God that I'm allowed to worship. And so that becomes, in some cases, as important as the church, or as important as Christ, and in some cases, more important. Exactly. So there's a world of difference between, God, I give you thanks that this home is my home and that you have, you have made it possible for me to live and worship here. Big difference between that and thank you, God, for the United States Constitution, which allows me to be a Christian. And I have had that conversation. Um, with very good and faithful Christians who don't believe that I love America enough. That if it wasn't for America, none of us would be Christians. That's confused. That's a confused allegiance. And it is not uncommon. It is not at all uncommon. Oh, Randy. Back when I was up in Minnesota and I had um, one of the Methodists fill in the pulpit for me, he preached on the golden calf. Mm -hmm. And then he asked what could some of those golden calves be in our world today? Yeah. And first he took the easy ones like uh, in Minnesota, the lake house or the ice fishing house or a BMW or a boat. But then he got to the question of could, could the flag be like a golden calf? Well, after he preached and I got back and um, uh, I was uh, at the American Legion uh, for dinner with some people in my church and one man in particular and his wife were both not just livid but they were they, they were shaking they were almost in tears uh, do not invite this person back to preach at our church or if you do let us know because we are not going to be there and, and they were they were passionate, Christ-loving, Christ-following people, but that particular illustration in the sermon, and he'd only asked, could it be, had really hit a nerve. And I, I really couldn't fathom it because I didn't fight in World War II. 
I wasn't, I didn't go through the same life experiences that he did. When I was 10 years old, we were going through um, civil rights and Vietnam War and Very any, anybody who had a brain on her head or his head were, were going to go to college and, and, and certainly not volunteer to fight mm -hmm. in, the, in the service. We're just, we were from a different place. And I guess my, my point with that story is that these were dear people and, and it was partially fear, but partially what you said, confusion. Uh, and, and not understanding it and not having the words to explain the, the, the difference. Uh, because there, there, there's nothing wrong with the passionate love for country. But for them, emotionally, it couldn't be disconnected from from yeah. Christianity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that they were in a different place that didn't make them bad people. Oh, of course not. Didn't Absolutely not. make them not. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, cold or lukewarm. They were they were they were passionate in both their love of Christ and their love of of country. Mm -hmm. But right. And and when someone says if this happens, I'm done. I'm not coming back. I won't be here. I won't be part of the fellowship. That gives us, I think, as, as leaders of the church, um, A, an insight into how high the stakes are. Um, folks aren't making these threats idly. And B, that there are, there are fears here, there are wounds here, and there are stories here. This stuff doesn't arise out of nothing. The Third Reich did not rise out of nothing. The German Christians did not rise fully formed out of nothing. So in answer to the question, how? How do we enter into these conflicts? How do we enter into this kind of pain that people have? We as leaders of the church need to remember that our unity in Christ demands that we enter into these places with compassion, with integrity. We serve Christ Jesus and him alone. Um, but also with, with curiosity. So I'll give you an example. Um, two weeks after the Dobbs decision, I preached a sermon that was deeply personal for me related to the Dobbs decision. And I didn't know what to expect from, from the church. I hadn't been there all that long. Um, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, I, people are going to be in my office screaming that I was preaching politics. That didn't happen. But about two weeks after that sermon, I went and I had dinner um, with a member who I, I like very much. And we had just a great visit and a magnificently wonderful meal. And then the, the parishioner says, I, I got to talk to you about a problem. And I thought, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. And this person said, um, I'm concerned about something you said that I thought was political. And so I said, okay, I want to hear this. But first, we need to get clear on what we're talking about when we say political. And this individual said, well, you mentioned something in the newsletter. I write those things for the newsletter, and they are out of my head two seconds later. You wrote something in the newsletter that I just, I just thought was not, uh, was not appropriate. We just don't need that. And so I said, and what was that? And so this person to their credit, pulls out the newsletter and showed me exactly what we're talking about. And the statement was, so I was quoting Wayne Dyer, who isn't exactly a Christian resource. Um, and Wayne, <laughs> Wayne Dyer said, uh, when we are squeezed, what comes out of us is whatever is inside of us, which I thought was 
brilliant, and obviously it was a low wattage day when I was writing this, this thing for the newsletter. So I was talking about um, how we need to cultivate in our, in our church culture and in ourselves um, an interior that when squeezed, what comes out, whatever it is, will delight and honor God. But I, I entered into this with so many of us are feeling the squeeze right now. Uvalde had just happened, so I mentioned that. I mentioned the Dobbs decision. Um, there was something else that was going on late June um, that I mentioned in there. She said, this right here, we, we don't need to hear about, about this. And she was pointing to the Dobbs decision. All I said was, we're feeling the squeeze, and here's an example. And so I said, okay. I need to be very clear on this to have this conversation. You are seeing as political my referencing a court decision that is dividing our country. Yes. Yes, that, that offends people. And I said, which people does it offend? Then we start getting into a conversation about who is and is not offended just by political speak. And, of course, I wanted to defend my opinion on this subject, but my opinion on the subject it had nothing to do with this article. And finally, I said to her, I know that you're really anxious about this, or you wouldn't have brought it up to me. What is your fear? And she said, as we said earlier this morning, my fear is that we can't afford to offend anybody. And politics are dividing us. We are too small. We cannot afford to lose people. And I said, you love the people of God in this church. You don't want to see any of them leave, and neither do I. But what is our job as the Church of Jesus Christ. And then we had this conversation about the church's vocation and about the difference between table manners, peacekeeping, and peacemaking, and the need that the world has for the church to be able to talk about these things civilly. And what I learned from that conversation was that we don't get anywhere as the people of God by trying to persuade the other person that we are right and they are wrong. No political convictions were changed that day. And probably still aren't. I mean, certainly aren't for me. But we left that conversation, both of us, knowing that the other person cared about them and cared about the church and cared about what Jesus wants. The relationship is okay. The relationship is okay. Um, and I think, I think that that was made possible because we both already trusted each other, liked each other. We'd had a great meal, a few glasses of wine. Um, there, was, there was a relationship there. There was an affection there that was able to hold that tension. And maybe that's something that we as leaders of the church need to be working on with our congregations. Um, I think sometimes, and I, and I say this as, as one of these churchgoers, sometimes we, we go to church, we do our Christian duty, we hang around and do small talk with folks afterwards and then we go home. But maybe we as leaders of the church need to be working on opportunities for people to enter into deeper conversation, entering in with one another into those places that really do matter deeply, that affect us where we live, that affect us where we feel, affect us where we make our livings, I mean, blah, blah, blah. Um, other, other thoughts about heresies and temptations that might threaten. Oh. Oh. 
we hand that to her, Linda. Thank you. All right, one of my favorite heresies, temptations, I like to think of as like a pastor who's standing up at the pulpit. If you would just fill in the blank. And I always like, if I would just do this, well, then everything would be great. Or if I would just do this, I would be faithful. Like, I started feeling it for a while, like, oh, God's really needy. Like, God's really <laughs> needy. <laughs> like, God can't be God unless I confess Jesus as Lord. God cannot be God if I hang out with drag queens this weekend. God cannot be God if I don't properly submit my will and... Um, you know, betray my emotions or, you know, if I don't bottle things up, then God's going to be really mad at my emotions or, mm -hmm. you know, if God, you know, if we would just, you know, maintain a personal morality that sticks, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of John Piper right now, but if you would just <laughs> do the thing, this generation, God would save this generation if you would just fill in the blank. And when I was growing up, that answer was always righteousness, personal, moral righteousness. If you would just, and I'll give you the example. I went to UGA, unlike my friend over here in South Carolina. I went to UGA, and the UGA football coach went to my church. He was a member at my church. So once a year in August, the entire UGA football team would come to my church, and the preacher would, would prepare a sermon with this in mind. And every year it was about sex. If you would just not have premarital sex, then God would be happy with you. Yes. And I just, yeah, I know y'all, y'all, you know, we preach a lot of sex in the Southern Baptist Church, all right? We don't get this from nothing. Well, that's where all the Southern Baptists come from. That's why the Southern Baptists have so much sex. But the the point is, you know, coming to churches that were very social justicey, oftentimes it was. You know, not a 35-year-old man with wife and 2.3 children in, in, in tight jeans who was saying this. It was usually, you know, a woman with a short haircut, like one of ours, who was saying, if you would just release the prisoners, if you would just donate more money, if you would just, and I'm kind of like, geez, your God's just as needy. <laughs> so what I often feel like I have to say to people is, you can do nothing and God will still be God. Your cooperation or rejection does not affect God. However, it might change the way things are going. Not that Christianity makes things easy, because it's not. But this is, this is part of your invitation to take part in the kingdom of heaven now. Yes. God doesn't need you like that. God wants you and chooses you. Sorry, I got, I got a little preachy, I'm sorry. There you go. There you go. If uh, Jim will just get the video cut and cleaned up, we'll just show that tomorrow. Oh, I can do that preacher all day. No, no, no. That actually is a, a good segue into our into how I want to wrap this up but I want to just see if there's any other any other remarks or thoughts you guys have about this that we've not heard yet okay right now <clears throat> In a culture that values the individual the way American culture does, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all, um, but it can go too far. Right now, the prevailing, um, not prevailing, the loudest theological narrative, the most insistent theological narrative, the one that we see on TV and hear on the radio, is about salvation. 
salvation. We got to be saved. You got to be saved. You got to do this to be saved. You got to say the magic words to be saved. You got to have sex with the right people or no sex at all to be saved. I mean, all of this salvation stuff, we got to be saved. Salvation culture is, um, is what the world is hearing from particularly American Protestantism. And that's not an orientation to salvation that Reformed uh, Protestants, like Presbyterians, generally take. But this very loud, very insistent, um, different theological narrative is really compelling, and it's what a lot of people in this country who are not Christian, or people who would like to be Christian but can't bring themselves to sign on, that's what they think we're about. And so here is, oh, I keep doing that. Here are some characteristics of salvation-oriented church culture. For one thing, it's self-centered. Jesus went to the cross for me and my salvation. Salvation is all about overcoming sin. And we've sort of got a, a parallel set of narratives here. Jesus overcame my sin on the cross, and yet, and yet, I better not be a football player thinking about having sex. Salvation culture is very much about punishment and reward. If you're a good person in the eyes of the Lord, you will be rewarded. If you're a bad person, you will be punished. It's very straightforward in that respect. Salvation culture tends to have church as the locus of Christian life. Although I will say that our Reformed church culture, I think that we've got a lot of this too. Um, that, that church is where all the action is. Evangelism happens through conversion. We got to persuade people of how they need to overcome sin, what the consequences will be if it doesn't happen, and then we get them converted. We get them on board with Jesus. And this is important. The kingdom of heaven in that theological uh, framework generally means something that comes after we die, or a place where we go after we die. Heaven is a very spiritualized other place, not incarnate at all. American culture, where we value this rugged individualism, this bootstrap orientation to life. We're big on continual quality improvement in our businesses and self-improvement of ourselves. We can always do better. We can always be better. Punishment reward system that we have in salvation culture, I think, has a corollary to this generalized anxiety that we see in our culture. We're just freaked out and stressed out all the time. And we're also a highly competitive culture. Sometimes that competition is fine and friendly, and sometimes it's gruesome. We see bad competition in corporate takeovers and, um, yeah, things like that. American culture sees the church as a very fine institution, as long as it's not messing with too much. Success through consumerism. This, this um, kind of gets to your comment, Randy, about the, the golden calves, the things that, that we hold to, the status symbols. And sometimes status symbols aren't even things. I mean, they could be um, a certain level of, of educational attainment or um, some other achievement like that. But this is all stuff that you can buy. And heaven is wherever I'm happy. This is the broader culture. And salvation culture, in many respects, is right, is right there with it. 
what we need, I think, to claim for ourselves and for our people. Oh, let me, let me just quote this. Um, this is from Matthew Bates' book, uh, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. Did I show you guys this one? I don't know if I did. Salvation by Allegiance Alone. Matthew Bates writes, Salvation culture encourages the self to stanch the flowing sin wounds by applying a forgiven so I can go to heaven tourniquet. But it does very little to remove this self from the center. That's, that's the heresy, that we're at the center of all of this. And everything in our culture strives to reinforce that we are the center of it all. That's too much pressure, you guys. Way too much pressure. So what we need, according to Bates, is we need to embrace a gospel culture. And gospel culture looks like this, Christ-centered. Rather than overcoming our personal sins or (laughs) other people's sins, which is always more fun, gospel culture is about overcoming injustice. Overcoming injustice recognizes that we are all of us part of systems. And because of human sin, those systems break down. Those systems benefit some to the exclusion of others. And that's not the will of God. That's not the realignment of power that Christ came to effect. Rather than punishment and reward, gospel culture is about restoration and reconciliation. The book of Ephesians tells, or is it Ephesians or Colossians? You know, they're basically the same book. One or both of them talk a lot about reconciliation, the reconciliation that has been effected by our Lord through his crucifixion, his death, on that instrument of imperial torture and his resurrection. Rather than church, ministry, is the locus of human life in a gospel-oriented culture of church. Ministry as our expression of allegiance to the one Lord, rather than the institution of church. And evangelism through relationship, and not through... um, coercion or shaming, but through these relationships of trust and genuine affection. And folks, these kinds of things take time. Conversion can happen after one really great concert at a Hillsong concert. You get people's emotions going and they're all up there and, that, and that's a thing. Evangelism through relationship and reconciliation and restoration, this stuff takes time. This stuff takes years. And our God is working on the timeline of eternity. We have time. And the kingdom of heaven is wherever Christ is surrounded by people who love him, people who are loyal to him, above all else, with all that that entails. And so Matthew Bates in Salvation by Allegiance Alone alone writes this, the full gospel keeps the focus squarely on Jesus rather than the self. And by self, I think we can include ourselves as individuals, but also our churches. The gospel proper is not a salvation procedure Focused on the individual, it is the universe-wide story of Jesus' entire revealed life, conception to ascension, from pre-existence to anticipated return, a story that unveils God's saving power for the whole created order. It is a salvation story into which, into which the individual can be whisked up when he or she joins the allegiant community. Gospel culture facilitates total integration, belonging, 
of the forgiven self into the cosmic Jesus story. Part five is all of us going out into the world and reckoning with this, wrestling with this, experimenting with this, trying things, failing, succeeding, learning. Oops, that was bound to happen sooner or later. We almost made it. What this response looks like, I believe, is the reformation of our congregations. Reformation unequivocally with Christ at their center. This begins with Christ's call to us and Christ's claim upon us. We don't get to initiate this. If we move into this reforming space, it's because God has already called us into that. This blossoms, or it actually continues with our practice of repentance and confession. We're doing that on Sunday mornings in our worship. Maybe we could be doing that in our meetings at the beginning of our Bible studies. People might say, oh, golly, the whole hair shirt Christian thing. But if they understand what this intentional process of repentance and confession is about, they know what we're trying to do with this. Some of them are going to warm up to it and be on board with it. This reformation will blossom when Christ clears out the cluttered allegiances, and that will take time. And I believe it will come to full bloom when the world knows that we are Christians by our allegiance by our allegiance to the kingdom of God and to our one and only Lord. I want you to join me in prayer. And then I think I'm going to turn it back to you, Um, God. Okay. All right. Um, How many of you are familiar with the Eastern Orthodox Church's Jesus Prayer? We've got a couple people. The prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. That's it. We're We're going to pray that prayer together the way we are often inclined to pray, be still and know that I am God, where we just drop some words off. We're going to do that with the Jesus prayer and see where it takes us. So I will speak the words. I'd like you guys to repeat them. We'll pause, and then we'll go into the next, the next part. So get comfortable where you're seated. You guys at home, get comfortable where you're seated. Take a breath or two. If it helps, close your eyes. And then will you repeat after me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. 
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Lord, Lord. Amen.